Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for this presentation, Federal Vaccine Mandates, How to Respond to Ever-Changing Court Rulings. I'm Tani Alvarez, a labor and employment attorney at Verrill. And I would first like to thank um, our two co-sponsors to this event, um, the Manufacturers Association of Maine and the Healthcare Purchases Alliance of Maine. And um, to start us off, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica Liberty of the Manufacturers Association of Maine to, to give a few words. Thank you, Tawny. We wanna thank our partners in this. We know that we are really in uncharted waters right now, and we're thankful for the partnership to present this information to our membership so that you are able to be informed on the latest of this ever-changing situation with the COVID vaccine mandate. So we thank our partners, Verrill and Health Purchasers Alliance, Trevor. I would just uh, echo everything Jessica said. We really appreciate the opportunity to take part in this and uh, hope that there are some valuable information for folks out there. Uh, I just wanted to give a, a very brief uh, background on who the Purchaser Alliance is, since I'm sure many of you are not aware of our organization. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization created by employers and public trusts in Maine to advocate for a higher quality, more affordable healthcare. And so really as part of that, a, a lot of our work uh, revolves around researching strategies uh, and issues like this to support uh, purchasers. Um, so I do have some information that we'll share later on uh, some resources to acquire uh, COVID tests and proctoring. Uh, I'll also share that in the uh, chat. But again, thank you for uh, the opportunity to participate. Thanks so much, Trevor. So we have a lot of information that we are going to run through during the course of today's presentation. You can find a copy of today's slides um, through a link in the chat window here. During the course of the presentation, if you have questions about anything that I'm talking about, um, please put them in the chat. You can direct it to me privately. You can direct it to everyone. That's the best way for me to respond. Um, if it is a question that is specific to one employer and isn't generally applicable, I'd ask that you reach out after the program. Um, we have a lot of information to get through in a short period of time. So let's get going and we'll go first with an outline of today's presentation. I um, I feel that it is important for everyone to know where we're going with the presentation. So let's go to that next slide, please. During the course of this presentation, you might notice me looking down. I am not looking at printed notes. I am sitting here patiently waiting for the Supreme Court to potentially issue a ruling um, on the constitutionality and the validity of the current OSHA ETS and the CMS mandate. If that happens, it'll be quite interesting. And, and our, my marketing team is definitely going to want to just give me a big bear hug because I didn't get this presentation to them until the last minute, hoping that I was going to have that information. But we're gonna talk about the legal challenges to all the mandates. We're gonna talk about what the rules provide and who's covered. When I say rules, I'm talking about the OSHA ETS, the CMS mandate, and the executive order for federal contractors. During the course of all that, we're gonna bust misconceptions. We're gonna help people understand what is and isn't applicable, respond to your questions. And then we're going to talk about best practices. Where do we go from here? What should we keep at top of mind? So let's jump into it on the next slide and talk generally about what the legal status is of each of these regulations. So the OSHA, ETS for employers with 100 or more employees is generally called a vaccine mandate, but it's important to remember that it doesn't mandate the vaccine because an individual could be unvaccinated and simply would be required to undergo weekly testing and masking. Now, oral argument was heard by the United States Supreme Court on Friday, and the OSHA 100 plus ETS is currently in effect. That went into effect yesterday, January 10th. 
all aspects of the ETS are in effect except for the weekly testing for your unvaccinated. That's not going to go into effect until February. But all other aspects are currently in effect and OSHA could enforce them. So that is going to include, and we're going to talk about it in more detail, having a um, the COVID policy, making sure that masks are worn, uh, being mindful of people who test positive and how we respond to positive tests, providing information to employer employees about um, safety and health precautions, and then also making sure that we provide paid time off for vaccinations under the ETS. As to the federal contractor executive order, that's EO14042. That's the Biden administration's executive order mandating that employers who have contracts with the federal government after November 15th, 2021 are fully vaccinated. That mandate has been stayed nationwide um, based off of a decision from the Southern District of Georgia that was entered on December 7th of 2021. I am going to note at this point in time that if you are not watching this presentation live, this presentation is occurring at four o'clock Eastern time on January 11th. And I'm saying that because during the last presentation I gave in the middle of it, we had a new stay issued and another stay lifted. So it is important to understand that this is the most up-to-date information that we have as of January 11th, but January 12th, January 13th, this could all be out of date. The federal contractor executive order, it has also stayed enforcement in Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, Missouri, Nebraska, Alaska, Arkansas, Iowa, Montana, New Hampshire, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Florida, Louisiana, Indiana, Mississippi, Texas, and Arizona. Many of you might be thinking to yourself, Tani, if it's stayed nationwide, why are you giving me additional information on the other states in which a state has been entered? The reason why is because this Southern District of Georgia case has been appealed. If the Court of Appeals indicates that the stay was improper and that a nationwide stay should not have been issued, right? The nationwide stay would be removed from a federal contractor standard, but all of these states that I've listed here would still have a stay in effect, okay? So understanding not just the courts that have issued nationwide stays, which means that it can't be enforced in any of the states, but also the other specific courts that have issued local or specific state um, stays or injunctions is also important because on the flip of the dime, if we have an appeal that removes the stay, we need to know what court ruling is currently effect in that jurisdiction. So that's a federal contractor rule. And all of these rules we're gonna talk more about, okay? Even this federal contractor one that stayed. And the reason we're gonna talk about it, why it, about the obligations is because tomorrow that stay could be lifted. Um, the CMS mandate, Supreme Court heard oral argument on the CMS mandate on Friday. So it's a separate argument from the OSHA 100 plus ETS. But on Friday, the United States Supreme Court heard over three hours of oral argument on these two issues. Um, they did it all remotely. If you had the opportunity to listen, it, it was a wonderful, um, it was a wonderful and long three hours. Um, so currently the CMS mandate is in effect in 25 states and the District of Columbia. It's currently been stayed in Alaska, Arkansas, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, New Hampshire, Nebraska, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Louisiana, Montana, Arizona, Alabama, Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Utah, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio, okay? So if you are covered by the CMS mandate, if you are not in one of the states that I just listed, you currently have the CMS mandate that is in effect in those states. Now, Recall that these aren't all going to, you're not going to have situations where 
the OSHA 100 plus um, applies and the CMS vaccine mandate applies. The CMS mandate is going to apply over the OSHA 100 plus, okay? Federal contractor is going to apply over the OSHA 100 plus. So federal contractor, CMS, those ones apply before we go into the OSHA 100 plus, okay? If, however, let's say the federal contractor executive order is ultimately found to be an improper use of, of executive power, but OSHA 100 plus ETS is still applicable, then an employer would, with 100 or more employees would be subject to the 100 plus OSHA ETS unless the Supreme Court has um, determined that the OSHA ETS is unlawful. Additionally, as if I haven't just given you in the last 10 minutes enough information to keep track of, you also have to be mindful of state and local rules and regulations. We are not going to get into those right now, but you do need to be mindful that if you're sitting here saying to yourself, okay, Tani, none of these things apply to me, you still could have local or state rules and regulations, and it's still important to stay on so we can talk about the OSHA ETS and how that is going to provide you with guidance on best practices, even if you don't have 100 or more employees. Let's go to that next slide. I think that the best way for us to talk about where we're at is from the OSHA ETS um, standpoint and really digging into the Fifth Circuit's decision. There it is what's important. There was a choice to file in the Fifth Circuit initially because of past precedent that had been um, ruled on in the Fifth Circuit concerning OSHA ETSs specifically. And there's not a ton of case law regarding OSHA ETSs. So the states that were um, suing to um, in an attempt to block the ETS chose the Fifth Circuit. But then everyone else filed lawsuits as well. And that's when all the cases were combined and we had the lottery. And the lottery resulted in all the cases being moved to the Sixth Circuit, right? But those cases weren't moved to the Sixth Circuit until after the Fifth Circuit had issued its decision. And in the Fifth Circuit decision, the court finds that the OSHA ETS mandate is over-inclusive because not every workplace in the United States has had an employee who has COVID. It's under-inclusive because there is no explanation or reason to say that COVID is more concerning or a bigger problem for employers with 100 or more employees versus employers that have 98 or 99 employees. They noted that an ETS under the administrative laws permitting OSHA to, to create an ETS cannot be used as a stopgap measure. But if you read through the narrative that OSHA provides with the guidance, it indicates, I don't wanna say an acceptance, but an acknowledgement that OSHA is going to affect different industries in different ways. A meat packing plant versus a bank versus a you know, financial institution, it's going to be different, but th this holistically is to protect the unvaccinated um, population. Now an ETS is only in effect for six months. So it'd be six months from November 6 when the ETS was issued, it would then be in effect for six months with the understanding that after that six months period, OSHA should be in a position where they can provide true guidance, go through the whole real rulemaking process as to the um, situation. With the healthcare ETS that came out in, um, in July, right, that a six month window, it expired on December 21st. That would have been the six month period of time. However, it was in effect until January 28th. We have not yet seen new OSHA guidance concerning healthcare facilities and best practices. So the ETS expired and no new guidance was issued. Whether that's because now most healthcare um, providers would fall within the CMS mandate or the 100 plus, is unclear, but the goal would be from an OSHA standpoint that it shouldn't be a stopgap measure, but instead should be very individually tailored. 
Now, the Fifth Circuit found that the ETS further flunked a cost benefit analysis, and that was based off of a $3 billion compliance cost price tag that had been estimated. And then at the end of the opinion, the Fifth Circuit noted some constitutional concerns um, under the Commerce Clause and the police power. These issues um, would be the last thing that the Supreme Court is going to look at because it's not gonna deal with a constitutional question unless it absolutely has to. So the Fifth Circuit ended up granting the stay pending review and it ordered that OSHA take no steps to implement or enforce the mandate until further court order. We then had all the cases combined, the Sixth Circuit ruled and on December 17th, they lifted the stay, okay? So they found that OSHA had demonstrated that there was pervasive danger that COVID-19 poses to workers. At that point in time, um, the plaintiffs in the matter um, sought certiorari to the United States Supreme Court. Briefing occurred between the 11th and the, I think it was the 30th. And then we heard oral argument on Friday in the matter. So that is the current, that's where we currently find ourselves with regards to the OSHA ETS. Let's jump to the federal contractor executive order on the next slide and understand where we're at with legal challenges there. So there's two um, kind of sub parts of the legal challenges there. One of them is that there's procedural issues as to the executive order. And I'm not gonna get into this in super detail. We could legal geek it out. Any of the attorneys who are on this podcast or you know this meeting, we could have a whole conversation about the procedural arguments here. Um, high level though, what we're looking at is um, that the argument is the OMB rule and the FAR Council guidance, their agency action, but it exceeds the permissible agency authority that's been granted to those two organizations. Additionally, the plaintiff is making constitutional arguments. They're arguing that the 10th Amendment, federalism and separation of powers, who has authority here, the state government versus the federal government, are also at play. So those are the arguments that are being made in an attempt to strike down the federal contractor executive order. But recall that's not before the Supreme Court yet. That's the um, that's the one that has stayed across the nation, but has a, isn't being sought review yet to the Supreme Court because we're still at um, the circuit level. Let's go to the next slide and understand where we're at from the CMS mandate standpoint. So as to the CMS mandate, um, one of the big questions was, is there any limitation on the secretary's power to protect health and safety of patients? Um, the court appears to, um, based off of its questioning on Friday, appears to all understand and believe that CMS has clear authority to impose requirements to protect the health and safety of Medicaid and Medicare patients. And, and during oral argument, we heard questions questioning that, you know, we know that CMS can impose hand washing requirements, okay, because it goes to the health and safety of Medicaid and Medicare patients. And really the question then is, are there limitations? So are there limitations? And if so, does this go, um, does this cross over that line into the limitations with CMS over, um, uh, overstepping its ability to impose requirements? So that is, that in a nutshell, right? 18 minutes, that's where we currently find ourselves. Now, what are some of the most common questions that myself and my colleagues are receiving. Let's go to the next slide. And the most common one is state laws and how they interact with these mandates, okay? If you're subject to the CMS or the federal contractor mandates, they preempt state law, okay? So if you're in a state that currently has a statute that says that you can't mandate um, vaccinations, the, the federal contractor and the CMS rules um, preempt those state laws. If you're subject to the OSHA ETS, if the, you have a state law that limits an employer's 
authority to require vaccination, then the ETS preempts state law. But if you have a state law that provides additional protections to the um, employee, so it would not permit you to require them to pay for testing or it would provide additional benefits to the employee, then the state law is going to preempt the ETS as to that more limited um, provision. Now, if you are a uh, employer who is in a jurisdiction that has a state regulation that says that you can't mandate the vaccination and you are currently mandating the vaccination pursuant to one of the C either CMS, the federal contractor or the OSHA ETS guidance, you're okay. But if you're not subject to any of those, you're not in a position then to mandate the vaccination and once the or once or if any of these vaccine mandates are found to be an overreach or improper use of power, then you're going to be subject only to the state law in the jurisdiction in, in which you operate. So that's how um, the mandates, that's where the mandates are from a legal standard and legal challenge standpoint, and then also how they interact with state laws in, in different locations. The good news is, is that in the last 20 minutes, the Supreme Court has not issued its opinion yet on the OSHA ETS. Um, so everything I'm saying is still up to date. Now, what workforces are covered? That's a really big question and important for all of you to understand. So under the OSHA ETS, who's covered? If you have 100 employees or more, all levels, all locations, part-time, full-time, remote, in-person. This is a beating, I call it a beating heart number, okay? So we're not looking at full-time equivalent. We're not looking at part-time. If somebody is employed by you and they work one hour a month, that is an employee, okay? If they work in... Um, Texas and the rest of your operation is in Virginia, they are still an employee. It's not like the Family Medical Leave Act where we're looking at 75 miles or any geographic restrictions. All employees, full-time, part-time, remote, in-person. And I say all employees, but then watch me do that lawyerly thing where I say, except, so here we're gonna say except, except independent contractors, which you all know are not employees, they're separate and distinct, and staffing agency workers, which again are not employees, those are gonna be closer to your independent contractors. Your staffing agency workers are going to be counted from that 100 plus standpoint for the staffing agency in which you're hiring them from. So those employees aren't being counted twice. Um, they're counted for 100 plus based off of the staffing agency numbers, not based off of your organization. Unionized workforces um, are covered under the ETS standards. We had the National Labor Relations Board issue guidance in early November after the ETS was issued, noting that the this, the topics covered in the ETS are not subject to bargaining unless the employer is given choices as to how to proceed. So if you were an employer who is subject to the 100 plus ETS, and instead of following to the letter what the ETS provides, you as an organization have decided we are going to mandate the vaccine, there is no testing alternative, that would be subject to bargaining under your CBA is what the National Labor Relations Act is. So if you're making a choice that's above and beyond what the ETS provides, subject to bargaining, I mean, you're gonna look at your CBA and determine it based off of that, but that's what you're going to be looking at. Now, under the OSHA ETS, recall at the beginning, if you're covered under the executive order for federal contractors and subcontractors, you're going to be excluded from the OSHA 100 plus because you're going to have the vaccine mandate under that EO. And then employers who are covered by the healthcare ETS were also excluded. Now, this is interesting because now we don't have the healthcare 
ETS, which means that nobody who was covered by the healthcare ETS is excluded. Okay, so if in November, December, you were, you were relying upon the fact I'm covered by the healthcare ETS, so I'm excluded, I don't have to worry about the OSHA 100 plus, recall that now we don't have a healthcare ETS, so you now would be included with the 100 plus OSHA ETS. Okay, let's talk about who's covered for federal contractors. Now, I am not going to read this whole slide because you're thinking to yourself, Tani, don't you have a business background? Nobody wants to see this many words on, uh, um, on a PowerPoint presentation. It's way too much to read. The only reason I have all of it there is because you have a link, see how it was just updated in the chat window where you can download it. And I want you to have this information. Really the way you should be aware of is that you're going to look at the contractual provisions that you have, whether or not it's with the federal government or with a prime contractor, because recall, this goes all the way down the line. You don't have to be a prime contractor to be covered by the EO. If you're a subcontractor, all the way down the line, whether or not you're three contracts down, the um, federal contractor mandate is going to apply. It's going to be for contracts or subcontracts um, issued after November 14th or solicited after October 15th, um, extensions or renewals after October 15th, all of those um, would be affected by this. Recall, currently stayed, but if that stay is lifted, um, then, then we have a multitude of states where it would go immediately into effect. Now, a lot of people, especially in manufacturing, have been saying, well, manufacturing is excluded. But the issue is, is that it's not specifically excluded. It's in a contract that may include the requirements. So what the executive order does is it provides each administrative office of the federal government with its authority to determine whether or not to include it. So each administrative um, office, or group kind of can choose whether or not to include this in its contract, which means Department of Defense's contracts are going to be different from the Environmental Protection Agency or Office of Management and Budget. Everyone has different contracts with different terms and they can include it. Contracts or subcontractor contracts that are under the simplified acquisition threshold at 250,000 normally wouldn't include it but depending on the agency, they could include it. Um, contracts that are awarded prior to November 14th, again, could include this. So there are a whole host of different contracts that can be included. It's really important you work with your operations team to review any contracts that you enter into after October 15th, specifically if you're potentially a downstream contractor to any prime contract. Let's jump now to who's covered under the CMS mandate. This is probably the easiest slide of the day for me. Um, if you're a Medicare and Medicaid certified provider and supplier, all eligible staff that work in CMS certified facilities, regardless of whether they have clinical responsibility or patient contact, the only people who are gonna be excluded are full-time teleworkers. And when I say full-time teleworkers, they are not allowed to enter the facility. So it's not someone who works at home four out of five days a week. They would never be entering any location um, where, where patients are or the organization is operating. They'd have to be 100% fully remote. Let's jump to what does vaccinated mean? And I think that um, months, two months, four months ago, you'd be saying, Tani, we are not, uh, we are educated individuals. We, we know what vaccinated means. But the thing is, is it's ever changing and it becomes that much more difficult to figure out what it means to be vaccinated. So under all of these rules, under the CMS rule, under the EL, under the OSHA ETS, um, it does not include a booster. So boosters are not required. Instead, we're looking two weeks out from the last required shot. So this is gonna be the second shot in a two dose um, regimen. So that's gonna be your Pfizer, your Moderna. 
or you're going to be two weeks out from the J and J one dose. Um, they're also, I mean, I'm focusing on the United States. You could have employees who are vaccinated outside of the country. You're going to focus on whether or not the CDC looks at whatever their vaccination regiment was as meeting the definition of vaccinated. But the important thing to understand is it doesn't include, it does not, does not include boosters and it does not include natural immunity. So both of those things are excluded from the definition of vaccinated. Um, I have been getting the question from a lot of employers, can I require a booster? Can my definition of vaccinated include the booster? Um, yes. OK, you can't then say that the policy is in line with what's required under under federal law, because that's not required under federal law. And recall that if you're going to require the booster, you're still going to have to permit people to have the same exemptions or accommodations that you normally would require for religious um, beliefs or practices and also for um, for accommodations for medical concerns. So yes, you could individually require the booster, but under all of these federal mandates, it's not part of the definition of vaccinated. So let's go to the next slide and let's talk about what's required. You're thinking to yourself, wait a second, Tani, we are half an hour in now and we haven't even talked about what the requirements of these um, rules are. Under the federal contractor executive order, there has to be vaccination and testing, masking and distancing, and designation of a COVID-19 um, coordinator. So all contracted, all covered contractor employees by January 18th, except if the individual is entitled to an accommodation for a strongly held religious belief or disability, has to be vaccinated. From a testing perspective, um, you, you don't have the ability to say, nope, we're going to do the testing alternative. You could use testing if the individual is entitled to an accommodation for a disability or religious belief, but otherwise everyone must be vaccinated. You must have masking and distancing standards set up. Um, unvaccinated individuals um, of a covered contractor, again, They'd have to have that religious belief or disability accommodation. Your visitors, you have to have physical distancing requirements and masking that's covered by the CDC. You also have to have designation of a COVID-19 coordinator um, who's going to make sure that um, the covered contractor in the workplace remains in compliance with the executive order. And recall that the executive order is the one that is currently stayed, but that we are still waiting for the um, circuit court to issue a ruling as to whether or not that stay was proper. Under the CMS mandate, recall that this is a mandate. Um, so if we go to the next slide, it's a mandate for your clinical and non-clinical employees. Um, it went into effect on December 6th, and as of January 4th, all employees needed to be vaccinated. For, so for those employers who are in the 25 states or the District of Columbia that weren't listed on that initial slide, because recall the CMS mandate is the one in which we have a, a split in the country, and that was heard by the Supreme Court and that we're waiting for a decision on, um, as of January 4th, everyone, whether or not they're in a clinical or non-clinical capacity needs to be vaccinated. Of course, you still are permitted the um, accommodations or exemptions for religious reasons or for um, health related reasons, but unless they get an exemption for one of those two reasons, they would be required to be vaccinated. There's no requirement for pay for time away from work if the individual or to get COVID or to be in close contact, unlike the former healthcare ETS. So recall that under the former healthcare ETS, employees who got COVID or close contact would then be paid by the organization for time away from work. No such um, standard is set forth in the CMS mandate. Now we're going to talk, we're going to go to the next slide and talk about the OSHA. And OSHA, um, 
the ETS has a multitude of different requirements and we're going to talk about each of them individually. We're going to do it pretty quickly because there are a lot of requirements to it, but I want people to understand that as of yesterday, if you have 100 or more employees, okay, between November 5th and right and now, okay, or if later you have 100 or more employees, we're going to talk about this, that it's going to be applicable. So the first step, one, OSHA ETS, you need to have a policy on vaccinations. And that policy has to indicate that employees must be vaccinated or they're going to be subject to testing within seven days of entering a work location. There's no su submission requirement, so there's not a portal or anything where you have to submit your um, vaccination policy or your COVID policy, you just have to have it in place in case you're audited. Natural immunity is not considered vaccinated. We talked about that briefly, but it should be included in your, in your policy. The content of the plan is going to be everything that we're about to discuss. So you have to have a policy and the policy has to include each of the elements that I am about to describe to you. So the first one being on the next slide, the employer or the organization has to have a way to determine the vaccination status of all of its employees. That is going to require that the employee provide uh, acceptable form of documentation that identifies their vaccination status. For employers who previously had simply allowed the employee to complete an attestation that they had been vaccinated, that is going to be insufficient. We need to have a copy of one of these documents that I've listed here. The only way in which an attestation is going to be permitted is if the employee um, attests under penalty of perjury that they have been vaccinated and they've lost or their vaccination card or documents have been destroyed and that they have attempted to garner a duplicate copy and been unsuccessful. That's the only way an affidavit is gonna be permissible. Um, each state is set up with um, a, a site and a location that you can contact in order to get that vaccination record. So there's gonna be very few times in which an affidavit is going to be permissible. One of the other questions we get a lot here is, does the employer have any um, responsibility if an employee fraudulently represents their vaccination status or provides a fraudulent card? The answer is no, unless the employer facilitated in the fraud itself. If there's a finding that there was facilitation and they knew it was fraudulent, then you could have problems. But generally, if you receive a, a, a fake vaccine card, you're not going to have liability in, in the future. Okay. Um, you have confidentiality obligations as to all these documents. So make sure that you're keeping them in a secure file. It should be separate and apart from their regular personnel file. It should be maintained um, in a similar fashion to any other medical information that, that you maintain about that employee with limited access. Now, the, the hard part here is that while we say limited access for that document, you're also going to have to create a chart that includes or lists all of your employees and that identifies whether or not they're vaccinated or unvaccinated. This chart would be provided to an OSHA auditor if they ever came and audited so that they could quickly see the percentage of your population that's vaccinated or unvaccinated on in one location. Let's go to the next slide and talk about the next obligation that employers have. And this is support um, for employee vaccination specifically. And what it provides is that employers must provide up to four hours of paid time at the regular rate. Now, <clears throat> the big question then becomes, wait, it's support for employee vaccination. And this goes back to why did I define what vaccination is or vaccinated is. Vaccination doesn't include the booster. Now, an employer could provide additional time for the booster, but it wouldn't be required under the OSHA ETS. You cannot require that employees 
use personal or sick leave for the vaccination. Instead, you're gonna have to pay them the, the four hours at their regular rate of pay. You can, however, if the individual experiences side effects from the vaccine, you can require use of paid sick leave um, if you as an employer have sick leave. But if the employer doesn't provide sick leave or sick leave is exhausted, then you're going to need to provide up to 16 hours of leave per shot for side effects um, that they are experiencing. You also can't require employees to, um, to, to use leave that has not yet been earned. So you can't require advanced sick leave to be provided and used. You can cap it so that it's only two days or that's 16 hours um, for the um, time. Now, we got a question concerning the last slide, which is regarding proof. Specifically, what if an employee refuses to give their card and wants to show it to the employer, but not have it tracked or in the system. So they've given an affidavit that they're vaccinated, but they won't allow the card to be stored. Um, the ETS requires that we have on that we have a, a copy of it. So you would have to tell them that under the ETS, we're required to have a copy of it in case we are audited. Um, they, it, they wouldn't be in a position where they could appropriately complete the affidavit. So, um, so un unfortunately, you know, that argument is insufficient under the ETS. Um, and, and they would be required to provide a, a copy of the card to be considered in compliance with, with the rule. Um, let's jump to the, the next slide, which, so we talked about support for employee vaccination. But what does that mean? Um, so if somebody chooses to not be vaccinated, we are going to have to require that there's COVID-19 testing for our unvaccinated workforce. This doesn't apply to our remote workforce, but if an individual is a remote worker and is going to be coming into the office or the workplace, they must be tested within seven days prior. So it doesn't have to be seven days prior, it just has to be within seven days of them coming on site. They need to have a negative test in order to come in. Um, isolation and face covering is insufficient, is, is what the ETS says, which at the same time um, is contrary to if an employee has tested positive within the last 90 days, Isolation and face covering is sufficient because no testing would occur for 90 days after a positive test. So if an individual tests positive for COVID, you would not be applying the testing rule for the next 90 days as to that employee. And they would then be unvaccinated and on site with simple isolation and face covering. Employers can use um, pool testing, which would be a whole group of unvaccinated employees to use a pool test. If there is a positive test, then everyone would need to be tested individually to determine who in the pool is positive. You have to maintain the records of each test result in the employee's medical records. Um, who pays? Um, under the ETS, the employee would pay. There's arguments that can be made that under Maine law, an employer would be required to pay for it. However, we've had discussions with the Maine Department of Labor, and they have indicated that um, there is the provision that provides that medical testing or a medical examination must be paid for by the employer if it's required. The main Department of Labor's position is that this is not required because you could be vaccinated and therefore wouldn't have to have weekly tests. So under main law, the ETS would be sim the same and the employee would be required to pay for it. Many states have very similar um, statutes that provide that if there is a medical examination, the costs associated with the medical examination must be borne by the employer. It's my recommendation that you contact your Department of Labor in the states you operate in 
um, to get a, a determination. If it's a state um, where Veril has an office, reach out to one of us. We can provide you with, with further guidance as to what those states um, provide. One important thing, however, to keep at top of mind as to this payment question is if you have a workforce that's making minimum wage, an argument could be made that by then requiring them to pay for that test, it brings them below minimum wage and you could be looking at a wage and hour lawsuit. So please keep that in mind as you're looking at your workforce and whether or not you're going to mandate testing for the unvaccinated. And then also the time associated with the testing uh, potentially is, is compensable. So for your non-exempt hourly employees, the time associated with getting the test and getting the result if it's outside of work hours um, may be compensable. So um, in Maine, we can require that employees pay for their own tests if they're not making minimum wage. So yes, Department of Labor is saying in Maine, the employee can be required to pay for the test because it's not required by the employer because the employer would permit people to, to be vaccinated instead of um, being tested weekly. Let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit more about testing. So under the OSHA ETS, it's very specific as to what test constitutes a COVID test under the rules. And it has to, it has to meet each of these three standards. So it has to be approved um, by FDA or under an EUA. It has to be administered according with the instructions of the um, vaccination. And it cannot be both self-administered and self-read unless you have an employer or an authorized telehealth proctor who is there as it's being self-administered um, and read. So you'd have to have a representative present during the course of um, that process. Now, one of the big questions that we've been getting a lot of is, that's great, Tani, thanks so much. How am I going to get my hands on a test that, that meets this standard? I'm gonna turn it over briefly to Trevor to hopefully provide a little bit of guidance here. Thanks, Tani. So our organization has done quite a bit of research into resources for testing supplies and proctoring. Uh, our medical director looked at over 60 organizations uh, that can provide tests. And uh, our staff uh, reviewed a short list of about 10 of them. There are two vendors that we feel comfortable recommending to employers, and those are Diamond Health uh, and EMED. Uh, both can provide bulk test orders. You order by the pallet, um, and you can order either Abbott by Next Now tests, Quidel tests, or BD Veritor tests. There's a lot of nuance to each test, you know. Uh, some are more effective than others. Uh, some um, can be electronically read, so you don't necessarily, at least my understanding, Tony, is you don't need to have the proctor uh, for the BD Veritor tests. Uh, so I would encourage folks who are um, looking for tests uh, or interested in this uh, to just reach out to me and I'm happy to share whatever information I have. Uh, I'll type my email address in the chat window. Uh, it is going to be tough, I will say, for some smaller employers uh, to handle a whole pallet of tests. Uh, so there may be some opportunity through the Manufacturers Association or potentially the Purchaser Alliance to go in and say split a pallet uh, for distribution after the fact. Uh, but again, if, if you're looking for tests, um, just reach out to me, you know, the information changes almost on a daily basis in terms of what's available and pricing and things like that, but I'll share uh, what I have for the latest information with anyone that reaches out. Perfect. And Trevor, if you can provide your contact information in that chat window as well, that, that would be great. Um, let's jump to the next slide. We got 12 minutes and we still got a lot to go over. We're going to try to get through all of it. Um, employees, if they have a positive test, you have to have in your policy a way for employees to promptly notify the employer. And this has to require the employers be told as soon as practical, but definitely before the start of the next scheduled shift or return to work. 
Um, employees who do test positive must be removed from the workplace. They may telework or work remotely. Um, Any time away from work is unpaid under the um, emergency temporary standard. However, recall that if you work in, in Massachusetts, there's still money that's required to be used under for certain employers under the Massachusetts COVID response. There was that 75 million. As of at least yesterday, there was still money available there. So they'd be entitled to up to 40 hours under the Massachusetts state law. Be mindful that other jurisdictions from a state standpoint may have some paid obligation, but under the ETS itself, there would be no obligation to pay the employee for time away from work. Um, As it relates to false positives, so if you have an employee who tests positive and then two days later tests negative, that you're gonna wanna go immediately to the ETS to understand because there's very specific rules regarding which type of test is going to overrule another type of test and and something that that you're gonna wanna be mindful of. One of the big kind of, things that I think is a misconception. We talked about the fact that I was going to point out misconceptions here. There is no rules or obligations concerning close contact or contact tracing under the OSHA ETS. So if you have somebody who tests, if you have someone who tests positive and has been in close contact with an unvaccinated employee, the ETS does not require that they move or that they be removed from the work environment. We know that the CDC guidance is currently saying they should be removed from the work environment. They should be directed to isolate. They should take a test if they're non-symptomatic after five days. All those things, none of that's included as a requirement under the ETS. So no requirement for contact tracing. And there's no requirement that you maintain records pursuant to the ETS rules. But this is, this is contrary to all the other obligations you have under different rules and regulations under the ADA um, concerning health information that you garner as required under um, the employment relationship. So you, you have other obligations to maintain the confidentiality of documents, but there's no specific timeline for re- maintaining records under the ETS. Um, The question, um, how often does a seven day test need to be performed? So if the employee is coming into work every day, the test needs to occur once every every seven days. If the employee only comes into work once a month, they need to be tested at least, they need to be tested within seven days of coming into work, but they'd only have to, that would only have to occur when they come into work. If they're coming into work every day, then every seven days they need to be tested. Um, Does the Massachusetts law allow for one week for each occurrence or is it one week per person? It's 40 hours per person under the 75 million that's at play um, for that if you're an employer that qualifies, but it's 40 hours total. Um, Question about if there's ownership interest So OSHA ETS applicability when an owner has several companies, each with their own federal ID, are the employees counted all together separately? If they all have federal, if they all have separate ENSs, most likely they're going to be seen as separate companies in order to determine whether or not they're an integrated enterprise for purposes of the OSHA standard or ETS, um, there is a, a, an analysis that you're going to look for as to whether or not employees perform services for multiple entities. But if all of your employers only employees are only providing services to the organization that employs them, okay, then most likely they're just going to look at the EIN. Uh, excuse me, they're just going to look at the EIN for that organization to determine how many employees each one has. Let's go to the, we have seven minutes, let's go to face coverings. This one, you just, it needs to cover, it needs to cover the nose, it needs to cover the mouth. Um, 
they can only be removed, if you're unvaccinated, they can only be removed if there's floor to ceiling walls and a closed door. It doesn't matter um, how big the room is, the door has to be closed in order for that mask to come off. When the employee is eating or drinking, if it's necessary for identification purposes, if the employer employee has to wear a respirator or face mask, then it could be removed, or if it's an infeasible or creates a greater hazard. For employers who are covered by the OSHA ETS and have not started to make a policy, please co contact me. I can provide you with a form policy that you can use to work from um, that will help you to create a policy that, that meets all of these um, standards, including this face covering standard. Let's go to the next slide. Notice to employees. Employees are going to have to be provided with a copy of our COVID policy. They're going to have to be provided with information as to how we are going to determine vaccination status information concerning uh, time off and pay regarding time off to obtain a vaccination and side effects, um, the procedure, what to do if they test positive for COVID or are diagnosed by a healthcare provider as having COVID, procedure for requesting records, and we're gonna talk about that procedure um, in just a moment. There's a document entitled Key Things to Know About COVID-19 Vaccines that's available through the CDC website. Anti-retaliation rights that are also available through, uh, that are available through the OSHA website. Criminal penalties for false vaccination cards, that's also available through the OSHA site. And then for unvaccinated employees, information as to COVID-19 testing and face coverings will also need to be provided to those um, employees. Next slide is about reporting fatalities and hospitalizations. So if the employer is able to determine that a COVID-19 fatality or inpatient hospitalization has occurred because of COVID being contracted at work, you're gonna have to report that if you have over a hundred employees, it doesn't apply to employees working remotely. You're gonna to have to do this by telephone or electronic submission, provide the business name and the information included on this slide. Um, can an employee remove their mask if they're unvaccinated in a closed off room with a plexiglass wall with a small opening? No, no, the, it has to be a closed room. The door has to be shut. Um, so the plexiglass wall is going to be insufficient because it has to be floor to ceiling um, for that. Can the notices be posted or do we need to provide each employee with a copy? Um, each employee has to be provided with a copy. Best practices would be to also post it, but no, with the next paycheck, you should be providing these notices to all of your employees individually. And then also posting it would be um, bell and suspenders, but best practice for individuals. Um, record availability, let's go to that next slide. So under the OSHA ETS right now, employees are entitled to see their own COVID vaccination documents and test results by the next business day. This part of the rule makes absolutely no sense at all, but what they're saying is, is if the employee gives you documents regarding their test results, regarding their vaccination status, they can see their own information that they provided to you, which arguably they'd already have a copy of. Additionally, however, uh, and if they can give consent to a third party to ask for and see those documents, and you must provide it the next business day after the request was received. Um, additionally, however, um, you also have to provide employees with two numbers. So if an employee requests, they need to know how many employees are in the workplace and how many of those employees are vaccinated. And that needs to be provided by the end of the next business day after the request was made. So it's not gonna indicate the employees' names. It doesn't have to indicate what division they're in or their location, but it has to provide how many employees, so one number, let's say it's 450 employees at this work site, and of those 450 employees, 410 of them are vaccinated. You'd have to provide the employee with those two numbers. 
And with that, I know for those of you who have attended presentations I've given in the past, you currently are just in awe of the fact that somehow in one hour I've gotten through all of this because I haven't, because I still have three more slides. I thought I was done, but we'll get through it in the next minute. Effective date of the OSHA ETS. See, this is super easy. Next slide. It went into effect yesterday, except for the testing aspect of it. The testing aspect of it goes into effect on, on February 9th. So two important dates. Yesterday, January 10th is pretty much everything. February 9th, however, is the testing aspect. Next slide, best practices. The rule has not been overturned, okay? You need to be um, complying with the aspects of the rule that are currently in effect. Additionally, this is the first time that OSHA has really given all industries an idea of what they think is important and what's not important. Recall that the general duty clause remains in effect for all employers with one or more employees. So general duty clause provides you have to provide a safe work environment for employees. OSHA has given us a decent roadmap about what they feel is um, safe masking if you're unvaccinated, having a policy that keeps people out of work if they are COVID um, po positive, um, if they're unvaccinated to have regular tests, to make people aware of um, ability to get vaccinations and, and side effects. All of those would be best practices moving forward to guard against a claim uh, under the OSHA general duty clause that you're not providing a safe work environment for your employees. Um, and with that, we'll go to the last slide. I am here, it's five o'clock. I'm mindful of your time. I know you have other places to be. You are welcome to ask questions in the um, chat function. Myself, the marketing team, Jessica, Trevor will be here for a few more minutes to, to answer those questions. Otherwise, um, we appreciate your attendance. We hope you stay safe and healthy. And thank you so much for, for attending today. Thank you, Tony. If people